Now we're going to We slept in a tree house. Dad built for us. We rode go-karts and later motorcycles. We mowed a huge four-acre lawn every Saturday morning. Dad helped Dad with gardening and feeding animals and other chores. I remember Michael uh, became attached to two of our ducks, and he named them Dilly and Dally. <laughs> One time we had a cow named Rosie uh, in our pasture and Michael and his friend Rusty and I got the bright idea. We didn't have a horse, so we wanted to ride. So we didn't have a horse. We tried to, so we lured Rosie into the shed to, to the salt block to eat. And I hung a rope over the rafters and jumped onto Rosie's back and she took off running and scraped me off under, under the branch of a tree. And when it was Michael's turn, we had the rope, who, the rope hung over the rafters and Michael didn't realize he had to grab on both sides of the rope. So he jumped in the air, grabbed on one side and it flew down and he busted his head open on a piece of equipment, but he survived. <laughs> um, one time Michael and I stole a pack of my dad's cigarettes and Rusty, he and I went in the woods and smoked them. And that night at dinner, Michael had a pang of conscience, a guilty conscience that he just blurted out at dinner that Rusty and I had smoked cigarettes there. And I, I froze like, yeah. And my dad goes, oh yeah, where were you? And Michael started crying and he confessed everything. So he, he had busted himself and us. And and so that may be one reason we we all eventually nicknamed him Michael Durong. But we mostly called him um, Mickle, Mickle Pickle or Mikey. Um, Michael knew what he wanted in life. Um, we had an above ground pool in our yard and my dad had built, but Michael wanted a proper pool so he could entertain all of his growing circle of friends. So he had dad build him a pool, an in-ground pool. And Michael could also be stubborn. One time we went on a duck hunting trip with my dad's uh, kind of macho friends. And uh, one of the guys told Michael that if you shoot a duck, you have to clean it. But Michael didn't want to clean the duck. So Michael just says, well, then I'm not going, I'm not going hunting then. He refused. Now, as we got older, our interest did diverge. Uh, I went to a private Catholic school in the next parish, and my brother and his, my sister followed me there briefly, um, but it was pretty far away from home, so they pretty soon dropped out and returned to the local school so they could be with their friends. Um, and so we were close, but we didn't have always the same interests. And Michael was smart, but when I get off on one of my tangents about philosophy or political theory, he would just say, you're so weird. <laughs> And my wife, Cindy, would sometimes nod in agreement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, my dad had built a tennis court in our pasture when he taught my mom how to play tennis. And so he became the volunteer tennis coach at Santa Monica High School, where my brother and my sister and, and Cindy were, went to high school. And so some of them would come over to the house to do lessons uh, or to practice at our house. All these high school kids, I didn't know because I went to a different high school. And Michael had by that time befriended Cindy, who's my age, but she's two years older than Michael. But Michael somehow befriended Cindy, and I would be in the I would be in the living room reading philosophy books or economics or science fiction, ignoring all these kids coming in and out of the house to use the bathroom. Michael said, "Stephen, there's a pretty girl coming by. You need to you need to meet this girl, which is Cindy." And I was thinking, if you like her so much, why don't you date her? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was 1982, probably 83. It was 19, not till 1991 that I realized why Michael was <laughs> getting the data. When, when I was going to London after law school, he came into my room and he said, Stefan, I need to tell you something. Because I had suspected he had lots of gay friends. <laughs> and I kept telling Cindy, I said, he's got lots of gay friends. And she says, but he had sworn Cindy in secrecy because he thought I was conservative. He, he didn't understand the difference between libertarians and conservatives. And so every time I would ask Cindy, she would say, no, I think he just has lots of gay friends. She kept the secret for, I don't know, five years. And so when I was going to London, Michael came in my room and Michael said, I need to tell you something. Well, he goes, I'm gay. I said, I said, oh, that explains. Oh. Can I get back to my magazine? Uh, I, 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 this is a story I didn't tell last time because Cindy and some other people said that apparently not everyone knew this story. Matt had known this story. Um, the reason Michael went to the National Guard, which I guess he was very proud of. So I assume he told everyone he went to the National Guard because uh, he, for various reasons. But the real story that I recall, that Cindy can recall, is that 
uh, we went to Michael and I, my, my dad said, I will pay for you to go to LSU, the local, the local college uh, in Baton Rouge, which is fairly cheap at the time, right? Um, uh, but Michael wanted to join Sigma Nu, the fraternity, and uh, that was expensive. And dad said, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm paying for college, and that's all I'm going to do. So Michael was, Michael wants to get what he wants, and so he was determined to go to Sigma Nu. So he realized, I can go join the National Guard, and they will pay for my tuition at LSU. So he went to dad says, if I get the National Guard to pay for my tuition, will you pay for Sigma Nu then? Dad said, okay, the watch to me. So, so that's why Michael joined the National Guard, so he could join Sigma Nu for training. <laughs> yeah. Now we were at LSU together, but we had different majors and different friend groups, except for Cindy, who was by then my girlfriend. So Michael was right after all. And we were always very close brothers. Um, I loved him very much, like a brother. Cindy loved him just as much more. Probably had more in common with each other than I did with either. He was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he would. I formed him out the task of taking her dancing. I like, I, I got to skip that activity. Uh, but he was very happy. We ended up together. He was the best man at our wedding. Um, and as we both moved around the world and the country with our careers, London, Prague, uh, Philadelphia, DC, um, we stayed close and we we saw each other as much as we could. Um, we traveled and visited a lot. We went to Turkey together, Capri, to Europe. Um, when we lived in Philadelphia, he visited us there. He visited us in, in Houston. We visited him in Prague and all these other countries. And in fact, every year I go to Turkey. I just got back a week ago um, to for a, for a libertarian conference, um, which is nice anyway. And, and I. I talked to Michael over the years about maybe joining me um, because we hadn't been back to uh, to Turkey together in about 20 years. And actually earlier this year, we were talking, I said, maybe you come with me this year because I, I never brought Cindy. I, 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 I always bring a friend or go alone. And uh, we actually talked about it, but we couldn't make it work. Um, but I was it was in Turkey just last week and I took some pictures and I wanted to text it to Michael and remembered, <laughs> couldn't. <laughs> um, in the last 15 years, we got to know and love very much. Matt is like partner at City, the son who adored his Uncle Mikey. Mike and Matt are so good together. And Cindy and I were had such a good time with them. And the, I think the last 15 years of Mike's life was, was the best. Michael was always reliable and dependable and a good guy. I could always count on him. And he visited me a couple months ago to help Cindy me out after I had a stupid heart problem. And my friend from Georgia was there visiting too and met Michael for the first time and fell in love with him. And he came to my brother's first memorial service in Louisiana after meeting him only one time, he and his wife. Um, he said, right before they died, right before Michael died, he said, Greg, my friend Greg said they were, he was texting with Michael. They were sharing ideas about TV shows to watch. Um, so we lived on other sides of the country and sometimes other sides of the world. But I always thought Michael and I would get old together like, how like married couples think they will and i figured he would outlive me because he's younger <laughs> and cindy would have him in my place but it was not to be i'll miss him so much if you believe in this way of looking at things you can think of him in heaven now with his dear canaan who also died too young i think of him grand <laughs> i think of him dancing now with my grandma theta one more can we call her with whom he was very close they like to go dancing together at this place in prairieville called the music box <laughs> you remember? Oh, yeah. This is sad for all of us, but it's unavoidable, unavoidable in a life with human relationships that matter. This is one of the sad times that we have to endure as the price of the good parts of life having meaning. 57 is too young. We lost our Mikey too early. It's hard on everyone who loved him. We weren't ready for it. It takes I take comfort in the memories I have of him now and how he enriched my life and Ethan's life and that of his family and so many friends. Although he died too young, he lived a life of joy and success and adventure. He lived far more in his 57 years than many do in 100. He lived long enough to become himself, to know who he was, and for everyone else to know who he was too. And this is why he has so many friends from around the country and the world who are in deep mourning for him as well. Look at how many of you are here and he would be so grateful and happy to see this. Michael, we, we all love you and we all miss you. 
We're all grateful for the time we have with you. Thank you for bringing joy to our lives and making life a little bit brighter than it would have been without you. No, I cried. I cried for minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so I'm not, I'm a very ugly crier, so excuse me. <laughs> um, so before I get started, I want to share something that Michael wrote. Before this is in 2018. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. And I'm going to struggle with the. Basically, Matt and Michael prepared for their, for their end, as good, <laughs> solid citizens should, um, after their dear friend, and many of you all knew Ian. And he wrote an email that Matt got or rediscovered, I would say, the week after my past. And he wrote, I have decided that when I die, if no parts of my body can be donated or used, well, let's say that level <laughs> <laughs> A little, little tag on that, my goal. <laughs> um, you want to hold it up? Anyway, I can't read this now because I just completely screwed it up. Um, I would like to be cremated. And my ashes scattered on a beach or vineyard somewhere from me. I will leave it to Matt or my surviving friends and family that I have named in this final will. Open a nice bottle of wine, champagne, or whatever guys you want, whatever you guys want. It was fun. So. So I don't need to say how special Michael was at all. But yeah, I'm gonna read because otherwise I'm almost not gonna get through this. <laughs> So since Matt asked me to speak at Michael's celebration of life, I really struggled about how best to capture my 32 year relationship with Michael. There is neither adequate time nor words profound enough to convey what Michael means to me or the impact he had and continues to have on my life. So paraphrasing from a W.S. Merwin poem, Michael's presence and absence has gone through me like thread through a needle. Everything I do is stitched with its color. So I met Michael 32 years ago when we were both young professionals in Washington, D.C., looking to make an impact for our work. I was hired to do training at the U.S. Federal Agency where he was leading the rollout of that training and there was Michael when I walked into a conference room. <laughs> this gorgeous, impeccably dressed man. And I thought, well, he's too beautiful. We will never be friends. <laughs> well, luckily for me, Michael had so many layers and such an expansive capacity to embrace people, no matter who they were. And so on a two-day business trip to North Carolina together, and I have to just say, we did this in a, in a white Pontiac rental car with plush burgundy interior. So let me just say, picture this. Our fabulous Michael had a field day with what we were driving because this is what the US government allowed us to rent. It was not fabulous. We laughed until we cried and discovered we had many similarities, including that we were both adopted into amazing families and raised in small rural towns. 
We both had lofty aspirations for the lives we would lead by getting out of those small towns. There are too many stories and memories with Michael. So if you want other funny stories, you're gonna have to see me after. <laughs> but as I am sort of a bridge between Prairieville to Prague, I wanted to share our dear how our dearest Misha became our became more and lived large while remaining the love, the loving and loyal son, brother, and friend to everyone here. While I suspect Michael was pretty fabulous since he was young, and I've got a really good story that his dad told us once in Prayerville, <laughs> it did take some practicing and trial and error on his part for him to become the paragon of fabulous that he did become. For example, after Michael met Robert, the deputy chief of mission for the Netherlands in, in DC, in the steam room of the gym, I might add. <laughs> And he decided to move into the large and well-appointed Dutch residence. Yeah, I'm calling this out. He's human, he's human, baby. That's why we loved him. He just, and when he decided to move into the residence, I helped him move from his, from his home at the time, which was a residence of his then current partner. Let me just say, this was a bit of a surprise for that partner. And as such, Michael needed to move quickly in one afternoon. <laughs> we then proceeded to stuff his belongings into large, black, hefty trash bags. Filling his Toyota camera, Camry and my Honda Civic full of his things, and perhaps a few, uh, few purloined items that he fashioned. <laughs> so while many of you may think he wouldn't settle for anything less than LVMH, I can attest that he wasn't, he wasn't always so picky. <laughs> Little did I know that this impeccably dressed, handsome man we met on day one, who I was sure had it all together, was also just a hot mess. <laughs> I cannot begin to tell you how many adventures and misadventures Michael and I had together and with others in Washington, D.C. From racing up Connecticut Avenue with him in his first convertible BMW, being his perennial, perennially late workout partner for years, to almost killing his dog Max and burning his house down with homemade candles I gave him. <laughs> and even when he moved to Brock, where he was making amazing new friends and creating an incredible community, Michael remained a steadfast friend and champion of mine and always made time to connect with me and to grow our relationship and our friendship. So if you'll heal me for just another minute, I'm gonna share a memory that speaks to Michael's loving and generous nature. So when I turned 40, you know, yesterday, <laughs> I had just survived a harrowing health scare the year before and decided to throw myself a huge party to bring my friends and family together. Michael literally flew to DC for four days to be with me and to attend the party with me, even though he had to fly back to Prague and was moving to San Francisco in just one week. Most people in the midst of such a massive change of life, an international move would not have come. And I, I wouldn't have blamed him, to be honest. But as we know, Michael was not most people. And he would go to exceptional lengths for his feelings. And finally, when I did finally meet my husband at a later age, he embraced Rob wholeheartedly. And when he gave his speech at my wedding, I could not have been happier and prouder to know him and who he had become in his own life and in mine. Our friendship brought extraordinary, ri extraordinary richness to my life through the particularly happy times to supporting each other through some very dark times for both of us. What I will remember and miss terribly is the way he viewed life and can make me laugh harder and more than anyone I have ever known, even when we were discussing hard things. Michael was fabulous, but more importantly, he made every one of us and his friends feel fabulous and like anything was possible. He could be disarmingly charming when delivering a critique, softening the blow of his honesty, 
because you knew he was a loyal and loving friend. <clears throat> Just as he allowed me to be myself and embraced all of me, I embraced all of who he was, including his darker shadow. I was absolutely thrilled, actually, when he met Matt, as I knew by the way he spoke about him, how he was determined to win him over, that Michael had found his true love and partner. The two of them went on to create a life, to live a life of passion, partnership, and exploration for 16 glorious years. And I know that Michael was happy and in love at the time of his death, and I'm eternally grateful. I know that Michael was happy when he was. One of my favorite quotes of all time, from, which is from Henry David Thoreau, and describes how Michael lived to a T. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. I am so, so honored and privileged to have sat at Michael's table of life. And I treasure every memory, lesson, laugh, mm -hmm. cry, and, and the friends, all of you, many of you that he brought into my life. He would not want us to be maudlin and would be insisting on high kids to get this party going. <laughs> so in honor of him, let's raise a glass and a leg <laughs> and toast the extraordinary human that he was and to be thankful that we had the great good fortune to know him. Hi kids, hi kids, Michael. Yeah. Okay, so I've written a poem, it's an epic poem, but before I start it, I'd like to just share a couple of thoughts. Michael had a superpower. We're all standing here knowing that Michael was our special friend, that we had that special relationship with him, that he was our best friend. And here's the thing, we were all special to him and we did all have that special bond. He had such a capacity for friendship, such a wonderful soul and the special friendship that we had is his enduring gift to us all and his legacy. I also need to let you know how instrumental Michael was in the foundation and the running of the Prague Charity Gala from the first year in 1999 until this day. Whichever country he was in, he would fly across the globe to help us raise money for hospitals and special schools around the Czech Republic. We will honor him this year at the gala and we will have a minute standing ovation and cheering for our dear Michael. Dr. Skrivan from the Mottel Hospital in Prague is unveiling a plaque in the ENT department, that's the ear department, in memory of Michael and the fundraising with which he helped with such dedication. <clears throat> And now to my poem, it's called Michael Kyle Kinsella, Our Very Best Friend. Michael, our darling, our wonderful star, we have come here to honor you from near and afar. We all knew you, Michael, in different ways, close to your family, your friends, and the game. <laughs> You brightened our lives and you lit up each room and we're really pissed off that you left us too soon. So now to the story of Michael Kinsella, a light in this life, the finest of fellas. He started his journey down in Baton Rouge, loved Brits, Jamblea and Stetson so huge. His Southern pride was the talk of the town, remembered his roots and loved a hoedown. Devoted to Patsy and Norman so dear, 
Wherever he traveled, his heart held you near. And Stefan, his brother, you were his rock. He'd boast of your IQ, your books, and your stock. <laughs> With Cindy, your taste so refined, run Shell and their home where your elegance shines. Ethan, so clever, so bright, it's true that Michael was proud of all that you do. Now, we all know Michael, the banker so prim, with a suit and a tie looking proper and trim. But if you peek back in time to the 90s, no less, you'll find him in fashion. I knew that you'd guess. At Prague's Madame Fru Fru, oh yes, it's true. Selling handbags and purses, all shiny and new. With a taste for designers, we'd know where he'd gone. He'd be at Tiffany, Chanel, or Louis Vuitton. <laughs> at Camper Park, he dined with flair. In Club Valentino, they'd all stare. With a Panama hat and a Rolex on tight, his designer shirt stood out at night. In Club Still Dawn, his drink in hand, the life of the party, you understand. But when it's time for baby showers or christenings, he's there with flowers. Weddings, birthdays, or ballroom toasts, our dear, loyal friend and a graceful host. At Prague's charity gala, where he was MC, dressed as Ken in a box or a young Liberace, <laughs> a cowboy, a fish, a sailor, an elf, a toga, a warrior in love with himself. <laughs> and oh, the dancing in his Tom Ford shoes, throwing it around with his salsa moves. Michael had stories as wild as can be, champagne in hand, sharing gossip for free. The stories got wilder, he'd have us in stitches. The king of the rumor, he'd share with his bitches. <laughs> And then came the day when he met someone new, Matt, just as bright, with a heart just as true. Dashing and handsome and loves a drink. <laughs> they were made for each other. Well, that's what we think. They traveled the world, California their home, with Sadie and Sal in Sonoma they'd roam. Babe! Michael would call. Now, where shall we dine? Can you make the booking? I'll pass around the wine. And the love of their lives was their much loved Tucker. Although he's their favorite, they call him a fucker. So let's all remember the thrill of his ride, taking risks, baking, breaking boundaries, and going to pride. Flying first class or business, champagne in hand, making friends with the cabin crew from takeoff till land. <laughs> and beneath all the fun was a friend, wise and true, with values he listened and gave you his view. Was discerning, you see. He chose with great care. If you were his friend, you'd been picked to be there. So here's to the joy, the laughter, his pace, and embracing life's madness with high kicks and grace. For if Michael were here, he'd surely say, life's been great. Now pass me a tray of fabulous cocktails filled to the brim. So please raise your glasses so high to him. We thank you, dear Michael. We'll never forget the times that you gave us, there are no regrets. You'll stay in our hearts as we say our goodbye, and we'll see you again at the bar in the sky. <laughs> Michael, our very best friend.
So um, we're not doing closing remarks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm putting Matt on the spot. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Um, we're going to put some fun music on and the party begins. So I, I expect you to dance. Yes. DJ Karen created created this list, and there is a Spotify for Michael. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, we're going to turn it off. I met Michael and he's okay. that part. Oh, yeah. 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 All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity.